I look at your skin and I'm going to come over now. Oh, no. Oh. Then I go around here. Trini Woodall. Beauty queen of the screen. Founder and CEO of Trini London. One of the fastest growing companies in Europe. Have a great day. I went through phases in my early 20s of not knowing who I was and turning to drugs. I went to rehab. I heard that you'd been kicked out the first time for playing a porn video. Yeah. It backfired. Rehab was a huge beginning of the change in my life. And I went into a whole new world. Following a 20-year career in media, the training took a left turn in the makeup industry. Here we are, $250 million later. Welcome to Trini London. A lot of people have a stigma that you can't start a business at 53. Crap. Age is just a number. But you need energy, passion, perseverance. I sold my house, hardly earning any money. But I thought, I'm never going to give up. Ask yourself, how much do you want to be successful? What are you prepared to give up? You strike me as someone that's incredibly driven. What's the cost? Very big question. Probably oddly. You had a partner who was unwell. Yeah. And the thing you think will never happen, happens. He died by suicide. Yeah. Where do you get to in your brain when you are so worried about your children that you can convince yourself that the best thing is that you're not in their life anymore? Was there anything I could have done to stop it? I think this is fascinating. I looked at the back end of our YouTube channel and it says that since this channel started, 69.9% of you that watch it frequently haven't yet hit the subscribe button. So I have a favor to ask you. If you've ever watched this channel and enjoyed the content, if you're enjoying this episode right now, please could I ask a small favor? Please hit the subscribe button. Helps this channel more than I can explain. And I promise if you do that to return the favor, we will make this show better and better and better and better and better. That's the promise I'm willing to make you if you hit the subscribe button. Do we have a deal? Trini, you've got a very um, distinct personality. Yeah. You, you, and you know that, you're well aware of that, right? I know who I am. But your, your personality is very... You're very straightforward. Yeah. Um, and all of these sort of defining traits of your personality. And I'm wondering if that was when that personality was formed or when it started to, to emerge. Things happen in your life that, that begin to, you know, fine tune and define who you're going to be. And I went definitely through phases, you know, I went through phases in my late teens, early 20s of, of turning to drugs just to not being happy with who I was, not not feeling, not knowing who I was. Sometimes people turn to drugs because they just don't know who they are and they want to, you know, they have an inner lack of confidence. And I definitely had an inner lack of confidence. And outwardly, when I talk to people and I look back at the time, they might say, you just were this very mesmerizing person. And I just remember that internal sense of feeling so lost, so profoundly lost. And... So when I got clean at 26, 27, that was a huge beginning of the change in my life. I was so relieved that my 20s were over. So relieved. Because it, you know, it was like that was the beginning of that. Let's whew, wash that away. And that was a big moment for me to begin to work out who I was. That was the first moment, probably. You, you're um, using drugs at 16, I presume, was quite a recreational thing. Yeah. I think we all dabbled. Yeah. At, at that age. Um, when did it, when did you realize that it wasn't a recreational thing anymore and that it was an addiction? I think I was about 22 and I felt my life didn't have direction and my, my family were very frustrated with me. They felt I'd changed. And like any family where they have a child who has addiction, they, they can, if they, don't know they just see change and they think why is my child changing you know so I think they saw that and it was a relief to say you know I I, I use drugs and I remember my dad said well now you've told me you can stop and I remember my brother saying I think it might be harder than that so I went to rehab and I then left the rehab after a period of time and 
You left the rehab or you were kicked I, out? No, I, I was kicked out of the first rehab, but I then went to meetings. And there's one thing about recovery is that when you first get in recovery, you, you need to let go of your old friends who you've been with, who are using, and you're about to make new friends. So that moment is loneliness can take you back to old habits. After about, I don't know, maybe six months, I missed my old friends and I hadn't made enough new ones and I saw them and then, you know, I relapsed and then I went back to some meetings and then you're in this horrible little in-between place. When you know about recovery and you continue to use, it's not so, there's something about an ignorance of recovery you know, there's a kind of sense that you don't know there's another way. So you don't feel guilty every time you do. And so what it brings is it brings guilt every single time. I had three really, really good friends and we were all using one night. And we, I said, let's all make a pack. We'll go to rehab tomorrow. And two of them had been and one of them had never been. But we made this pact. Late night, you know, that thing. We're going to do this. We're going to conquer the world and we're going to go to rehab. So then the next morning, I woke up and I still had that feeling, which is rare. So I called a therapist that I knew and I said, I need to go, but I have a window of opportunity, which is so small. I need to go literally in the next two hours because I am scared for myself that I'll change my mind. So he got me in somewhere and stayed there for five months and I sold what I had to pay for it. Some very tragic thing happens in that time. And one of the people died. And then... One of the people that said they were going to go to rehab with you. Yeah. And then I went to a halfway house in Western Supermare for seven months where you kind of live off eight to ten pounds a week, which pays for your fags. And I worked at an old people's home. And then I came back to London, a very different person. And... Then in that following year, another one of them died. And then by the end of two years, they'd all died. So I think I always had this feeling, whatever I might do, you know, I might do many things again, but I will not take drugs again. And you do that in recovery, you do it a day at a time. And since that day, I have never taken a drug again. And that was that big, that's probably that biggest shift I had at that age to really think, now I have this second chance. What do I actually want to do with my life? You know, what, not what I feel other people expect me to do. If I was a fly on the wall in your life, at, at your, when the addiction had you the most, what would I have seen? You wouldn't have seen anything that I was feeling inside. Because that's what I was very good at. So outwardly, you would kind of think, you know, I worked in the city, I was trading commodities, I was, I held down a job. You know, you would see this person who seemed to be running around doing a lot of stuff. You would see that. Yeah. So mine wasn't jacking up in the street, not being able to function on a daily basis. Um, but it was one where appearances were so important compared to, you know, so that matching your inside to your outside is probably my biggest journey, you know, of how can I, what I feel inside is how I share with you now. And, mm. you know, I am 59 and that's where I've got to. I have a lot. <laughs>
more to do. But I, it took me a journey to get to a place where I feel very comfortable in that feeling and in that belief. Matching the inside with the outside. So the outside, I would have seen someone who was very busy and apparently, you know, professionally successful in the city. Not uh, feeling it, but sort of acting it. Acting you know that. It. I mean, the my God, we know that one. And then Fake on the-, the CV, act it, you know, be kind of big up the job that was actually smaller than it was. All of that shit. And then on the inside? Feeling, feeling, you know, I hate to say the word because I hate, I hate labels. Imposter syndrome is the worst. Can I just say it's the worst label? It's the worst label ever because it, what it denotes is that you are an imposter um, for how it's used for now. So to me, imposter syndrome is more that you haven't yet learned enough. And if you learn something, you won't feel so much of an imposter. This is what imposter syndrome is, what I'm referring to. It's that feeling where you are so different on the inside from what you project on the outside that you are an imposter inside your own body. And that to me is what I think imposter syndrome is. What's the, what's the cost of, of that? That at some stage you can't keep doing it and you ha- something has to give. And something always has to give. And, and it's whether you, it's which path you're going to take, you know? Because there'll be a lot of people listening now that are in a job or a situation where they, they have that feeling, that niggling feeling mm-hmm. that they're in the wrong place. Yeah. You, they might be held there by social groups or expectation from mm-hmm. their parents or whatever mm-hmm. it might be. But something's holding them there. Yeah. Maybe fear of uncertainty. I would say if somebody is listening to this and they're thinking, do I have little bits? Just ask yourself... You know, do you love what you do? The job you're in, if we're talking about work. Do you love what you do? Do you like this environment of where you work? Do you feel people make a better contribution than you? You know, is that what's making you feel insecure? If so, what do you feel when people have meetings that you don't know? Go and fucking learn it. Go and learn it. Go and listen to podcasts. Go and read some books. Just learn it because knowledge is, is powerful. And when you have knowledge and you walk in a room, you automatically think I have so much more to contribute. If, if I answer one of those, I challenge myself and I go, I don't like where I'm working and I don't like it. Yeah. And I'm, you know, a commodities trader in the city, for example, and I just, I hate it. Yeah. Leave it, but have a plan, but leave it. Like if you hate what you do, we spent 16 hours a day between commuting or if you're in a higher position thinking about the company working we spend much more of a day working than sleeping so you've got to love it mm. you've got to love it you know i was like in my early 20s i was one woman 64 men on a trading floor and i hated it and i dressed in men's clothing and i went to rosetti and got the men's shoes and i got the tailor to make me a suit all the men would drop their trousers in the on the trading floor but i'd go in the ladies room and get you know i'd pretend to have a deep voice so i was on the phone selling anglo-american funds so my clients thought i was a man i mean you know, I did all this stuff. I hated it so much, Stephen. And I would go, I would take the tube to Tower Hill. We were at the World Trade Center in, in London. I'd have the Financial Times on the outside and the Daily Mail on the inside. That was my full extent of who I was. And, you know, I left it. Were you an attention seeker more generally in life? Because when I re- heard that you'd been kicked out of rehab the first time for playing a porn video. Yeah. I thought... <laughs> that that was that was a, a a funny one but not funny in the end um it was a terrible rehab i was with somebody um uh to last night in new york and we were going to this funeral of this friend of mine who was like 43 years sober and um i discovered i'd been to the same place with her and um rehab we, same rehab. Yeah, uh, but at different times. And she just said, you know, it was the most fundamentally shaming place ever. You know, rehab now are very different, but it was a very, very shaming place. And it would be closed down now. It wasn't, it didn't have a good way of dealing with things. So in that whole scenario, there was definitely that feeling that you're, you're, you're thrown in with people you don't know and you reveal your life. And it was a time when 
you would write down your life story and then in rehabs nowadays, because I visit friends in them or whatever, you would kind of, people help you navigate why you did things in your life. But in this one, they did the stuff where they would get 20 people to critique how bad your life had been in a room and and judge you for it. And it was, I mean, just like looking back on it now, at the time, that was the only way recovery worked in rehabs in the UK. But it was just, it was kind of fucking appalling. And she reminded me last night. So when you bring up the thing of that, of that um, porno film, and I think it was that sense of let me just do something that people will find funny because we're having such a shitty time here. Mm-hmm. And it backfired and it was just, you know, I was chucked out. What I haven't been able to pinpoint is, because at least from the outside looking in, your life was, you know, you had a great job. You had this um, addiction, which didn't seem to interfere with your work. So, you know, when I sit here with someone like Macklemore or Russell Brand, or even I remember speaking to Steve-O, they, they talk about their addictions and, you know, he was he was on a, I don't know, four or five day heroin binge and he drove a car, he said he was going to, I think he drove a car through a house and then yeah. was threatening to jump out the window yeah. when, you know, he, he ultimately ended up in rehab. But it didn't seem, I can't identify the, the symptoms that drove you to go, I can't do this anymore. I think we have... Everyone has a different story externally of I did this and I did this. And there's a bit of I did even more than you. You know, there's mm-hmm. a, 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 there's this whole thing in, in that, you know, addicts maximize their using and alcoholics minimize their drinking. All right. Mm-hmm. And that's why alcoholics can take longer to get into sobriety and, and addicts can take shorter because also drugs can kill you quicker. Mm-hmm. Um so there are, there's that kind of, you know, and I think also, I don't know, it's, it's, it's different. But um, maybe I don't talk so much about the crazy things I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I think we all do crazy things. Yeah. I you mean, know. We all do crazy, crazy things. things that I... And, um, but I, I feel that I have a daughter who's 19. Sure. And I wouldn't talk about crazy things I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we move on from that. And then the next sort of 10, 15 years of your life, you have this media career. How aligned were you at this chapter of your life? Um, So when I did TV uh, and writing, I really loved that. I think what was very nice is we developed this, these women who found us a breath of fresh air. I love the fact that people would say, you know, I read your book and it's changed how I think about myself or... You know, and at the time when we look back at what not to wear, it's a very divisive show. At the time, it made a lot of women and women that I meet now who watched the show at the time tell me the impact it had on them to think about themselves differently. But I enjoyed it. I enjoyed traveling around England and making over women and having that journey. And over, you know, over a week, you saw the metamorphosis of a person you work with and you saw them at the beginning and at the end. And then we kept in touch with many of the women. And then you would hear about their marriages and their babies and their life changing. And, and the, you knew there was a tiny contribution you'd made to that switch in them, mm. turning the switch on to feel different. Why did it end at the show? We'd gone from doing a series of that IT, with ITV a year and writing a book a year to doing three or four shows. I took on average about 55 flights a year. I left London on a Sunday night. I came back on a Friday. I had a seven-year-old daughter. And I had a partner who wasn't always well. So it was just at a stage where I thought, I need to readjust how my personal life is. And I need to think, what can I do now? Because this doesn't work. I had a partner that wasn't always well. I remember reading a line in your book where you said 99% of the things we worry about don't happen, but that 1% happened to us. Mm. And he said it to me. Is that what he said to you? Yeah. He would always say it. I mean, I always remind Lila, what did Dada say when she's worried about stuff? And he said, he's the one that said the 99% of things we worry about don't actually happen. Yeah. I had a partner who was unwell. Unwell in what way? Addiction. He was addicted to... Yeah. And you you met him when you were 35, right? No, no, I met him when I got clean. I met him when I was 27. Oh, you got married when you were 35. Yeah. And he was in recovery. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
so okay you met when you were younger you um went through recovery he went through recovery as well but then yeah. relapsed he had a motorbike accident and he was very badly hurt and he took painkillers and got addicted to the painkillers yeah. what is what is what is that like because people think of painkillers that don't know addiction to painkillers and they think of paracetamol or something mm -hmm. my ex only experience with painkillers is taking a paracetamol maybe four years ago I think when you're in a relationship with somebody who has a form of addiction, there's an unpredictability and an inconsistency in how they turn up every day. And I think in any times when it's not great, you end up to an extent having the crumbs off the table it's like you're so holding on to those moments when everything's good that you try and ignore what isn't working and at the same time i was thinking about well you got married in the year that you were starting your business your tech company it's a lot to deal with if you've got a, a partner at home that you're married to that's is struggling with addiction you're starting a business yeah but they were well at that time okay yeah they were well at that time Okay. They had periods definitely through our through our marriage where they were well, really well. The relationship breaks down? Yeah. You get divorced? Yeah. You go your separate ways? You remain close? Yeah. And then Johnny ultimately passes away around the time when you finish, before you start Trini London, mm -hmm. but around the time when you finish What Not To Wear and you, you separate from Susan. Yeah, I separate from Susanna and Susanna. I started working on, I'd started working on Trinity London. Yeah, but I was still filming abroad. I was still doing telly shows abroad, but I was also working on the business. And you were close to him yeah. still, even though you'd separated. Yeah. We spoke every day on the phone. Every day? Yeah. He passes away when you're 50? Yeah. How does that change things in your life? Um, biggest change is you become a single parent. Um, the thing you think will never happen, happens. So it's a wake up call just for life and how you see life. It took me a long time to grieve because he left a mess and he died, which yeah. I had to kind of deal with a bit, yeah. Financial mess. Just, yeah, just a mess. And so it preoccupies you to not then actually just think about what you miss in somebody. You know, it just, you focus on what you've got to do. You go onto autopilot, you think of the kind of things you've got to deal with. And probably oddly, I moved in March and that was the first time I remember Lila went away and it was the first time in 35 years I'd been on my own in a house. And I grieved for Johnny all these years later. Did, did something tr trigger that? Or? No, I think it's just you need, sometimes you need space. You need to, you know, he died, there was a mess. I then, starting the business, I was living in a house I couldn't afford to live in. I had to sell it for lots of reasons. One of them, you know, for that reason. And... There was so much I was, so many sort of fires I was dealing with. And and then I was, you know, trying to start the business, trying to guide Lila to, you know, be okay. So there was a lot of years of that. And then another life change of just deciding I want to live on my own. Then brought up in a way to be able to just feel some things that I hadn't really let myself feel. And I think sometimes in life, 
we know we're not in that part of that strong enough to feel that feeling and move forward. And we have to be in the right situation and give ourselves that right breathing space to be able to feel the fullness of that feeling without judgment or guilt or remorse, you know, because all the other ones are so connected to situations externally. And it's very difficult to get to a situation where you're not bringing all the external factors in and you're just feeling how you feel about somebody. What was the fullness of that feeling in that moment? I think... Um, that there was nothing, there's nothing better in anyone else than the bestness of Johnny. If that makes sense. And I missed it. The, the circumstances of his death are particularly complicated mm -hmm. because he, he didn't die by natural causes. Mm -hmm. He died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And having sat here and spoken to people who've lost a partner or an ex in such a way, um, the feelings, uh, from what I've seen, are com much more complicated. I think anyone dying who dies unexpectedly, whether from illness or anything, it's... Somebody is gone. You know, that's, that, that's the biggest fundamental of anything. The circumstances drive how differently people deal with death. So, you know, some members of his family wanted to believe there was a conspiracy theory. Some, you know, you, you, you suddenly have 101 kind of views on things and stuff that really confuses and complicates the fact that somebody has gone. You know, they've gone. Nothing is going to bring them back. They have gone. But it leaves more questions. And then you look at your part in something, you know, and that's every person who has had somebody commit suicide at some stage will say, was there anything I could have done to stop it? You know, that's the first thing, for sure. If you love somebody... Um, and the more I have learned about suicide, the more that you know that when people, when people will talk about wanting to kill themselves, I'm not saying it happens less frequently than people who don't, but once somebody makes a decision that that's what they're going to do, they don't talk about it, you know. And you'd like to feel you'd pick up on it. But I think it's the hardest lesson to learn. But when you then come across people where you feel that you now pick up on those not saying things, that there's a lot of internalizing going on. And should you be reaching out and just talking, getting them to talk? Because people get themselves to a stage where they feel it's the only solution. And what's staggering is Johnny had hypervigilance around his children because he'd been in the Israeli army and he was paramedic. And he had a really, it was a really tough uh, situation. And he, he had from it post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't um, acknowledged, you know, it wasn't um, diagnosed until about 20 years later. But one of the things was his hypervigilance around his children. So he had, he was always so, you know, worried for their welfare. So you kind of have this thing of where do you get to in your brain when you are so worried about your children that you can convince yourself that the best thing for your children, who you love profoundly, is that you're not in their life anymore. And that, I 
is something that is so important that we can help people who get to that situation, that they don't get to that final part of that situation. And it's understanding what to recognize, it's understanding, you know, and it's very hard to recognize. You know, I didn't recognize. And there were lots of details of it which could have really upset me, you know, of things that were done wrong, just were just like police stuff that was done, you know, lots of things which you could hold on, you can hold on to lots of things. But you kind of have to let go. When I see people who have family who have died and they want to hold on to things or get this thing, you know, and it's like all those things you might hold on to will prevent you to go through the process of grieving because it will hold you in this place and time and you will just be sitting with that, you know, and you won't be able to work through. And, you know, when somebody dies, you need to work through these stages and acknowledge these stages, but not get stuck in something which eats you up. So even though there were all these things that kind of could have eaten me up, I sort of knew, and I had a very good, there's a wonderful one called Julia Samuel, and she wrote This Too Shall Pass, and another book called Grief Works. I don't know if you've ever had her on your podcast. She's an incredible um, grief counsellor. And... I saw her straight away. She came to my house when when I knew, and I hadn't yet told Lila. Because the first thing is you need to find the words of what to say. She um, was a friend of my sister, and she gave me words. It's like you just feel so... Like this. I'm at a good place with it now. And I think that final thing was this the moment I had by myself when Lila went off and for a week. And I just, I thought, okay, I'm very, I'm totally, you know, this is eight years later. But things take time. So interesting how the the process of grief that those first sort of eight years where you kind of compartmentalize or it's not the right time to address it yet because mm -hmm. there's other things going on. And then eight years later, how it can show up in a moment of like solitude and yeah. in, in a moment of space and come out. It's interesting because I think there's so many of us, whether it's the grief of losing someone or the grief, grief of some other form of trauma that we haven't compartmentalized and it might be um, impacting our lives in ways we don't we don't understand. Mm hmm. I hear this a lot when I speak to people about, you know, their mood or, you know, they, they were a slightly different person through that period, but until they were able to kind of sit down and confront it and, and go through the process of grief, they, they didn't realize that they had, it had changed them in some way. Eight years later, mm. you have your moment. Mm. 53 years old, you start. Trini. Yeah. Big smile on your face. Mm-hmm. You know, st starting a, a business like that at 53, a lot of people have a like a stigma or a stereotype that you can't start a business in midlife. You know, you shouldn't be doing that at that point or that, you know, you won't be able to raise, you know, all of those kind of stigmas around starting a business in midlife. Crap. Crap, yeah. Total crap. I started a business at 16 called, what's my first business? Bose Unlimited. When I was at school, I sold yeah. hair bows. I know. Um, and then I started a business at 53. So it's like... There's no other way to put it that, that age is, is a number. It is just a fucking number. And you can either mention that number endlessly or you can look at what energy do you have at that moment in time to execute on your dream. That's all, it's, that's all you need. Energy. All you need. Well, you need a lot. But, you know, you need to feel that. You need energy, passion, drive, relentlessness, perseverance resilience pick yourself up and just get fucking on with it you need all of those things but you need the energy so that you jump out of bed in the morning and you are on it 
did it take time for you to cultivate that in the, in the no. passing after jo after Johnny had passed? Was there like a, do you know what I mean? Because I did, I did uh, Ready To before and for that I was, right. you know, I did 18 hour days for two and a half years. It's like, it, you know, it's, it's in me that I've, I've been a grafter for quite a long time. So and you'd been mulling this idea for many, many, many years. And yeah. then, um, and then you finally put it into action. I, I heard you say I started pitching in 2014 and it took me three years to launch. Yeah. I started pitching in 2013, I think. And what were you pitching? I was pitching. What was the elevator pitch? The elevator pitch was um, to create portable, cream-based, personalized makeup for women 35 plus. And how was that pitch received? I did 48 pitches before one person bit. I must have sent 300 emails. What kind of uh, negative feedback did you get? Oh, I had lots. I had, um, I had, you don't have enough followers. Fine. I had like, I think 50,000 followers then. Um, I had, you're too old to start a business. I had, who's going to really run the business? Classic. Oh, that that's a nice little oh, I back backhanded. I love that one. You live in this Neverland. It's not like it's never going to happen, but it's never going to happen. But you don't put words to either. You sit like this place. And I had that feeling. I thought, are people ever going to get it? But I thought, I'm never going to give up. So they both sat side by side really strongly. Why didn't you give up? Because I knew it was a fucking good idea and I knew it would work. I just had to find the right people who would get it. But everyone's know. telling you no. Everyone's telling you to. I don't care if everyone's telling me no. I know. And I know enough and I believe in myself enough to know I know it's a good idea. I just know it. I just got to find somebody who has the vision to understand it. How so, do you know it though? Because I know women. Because I've made over 5,000 women in my life because I know what women miss. I know the frustration they feel at the beauty counter. I know that some of them don't want to admit they don't know how to do a smoky eye. I know that some women feel stuck but they don't know how to articulate how do I do it again because I don't want to seem silly in front of my friends. I know that some women feel just... They could never do that. Was it expensive to start the business? Yes. What were the personal sacrifices? There are phys uh, there are financial ones and there are friendship ones. Did you have to sell any tables? Let's start with the financial. No, but I sold my house. You sold your house? Yeah, I sold my house. And I kind of... Why? Because I couldn't afford to stay in it. I had debt. I had a big mortgage. I had kind of... When I separated with Johnny, I'd wanted to get this house that I bought that would enable me to walk my daughter to school. I just wanted this thing, okay, like desperately. So I bought this house with a really big mortgage and I did a loan and I did it from scratch. And it was my dream, every single little element of this house I built. Did that make you sad, that realisation? Because it seems like it was The idea that I would have to leave the house was something I thought about every single day for six months and thought, what can I do to prevent it? Because I've worked this hard for so long to have this house. I've always wanted to own a house, you know. But once you let go of it, it's just a fucking house. And you think there's a bigger picture. And the bigger picture, maybe you could buy me five houses, but the bigger picture is that there is a bigger picture, not even to look to the stage where you might be able to buy a nicer house. But it's like, I was on a mission, Stephen. I was on a mission. I thought, I've got to make it happen. I can't not do this. There was no turning back. I couldn't not start the business. So then it was, what did I have to do to start the business? Because first of all, I sold all my clothes. I did the sale and I went on to Emily's list and I, Emily's list is this, and I was renting out the house. So I didn't care who came to my house. I had like a thousand people coming in my house buying clothes. So I raised in two sales 60 grand. Because I used to follow, I used to follow Gary Vinacek, and Gary was always like, "What the fuck can you sell in your house? You know, you can sell your trainers. You went and spent a fortune on those people who were saying, oh, whinging to Gary.' And Gary saying, "Sell something. Everyone has something they can sell. Well, how much do you want the business? How much do you want to be successful and start the business? What are you prepared to give up? Look at the long term gain." Was there any doubt 
even a whisper of doubt. I say this in part because I look back on when I started my business, I was keeping diary entries. Yeah. Um, and I was, I, f- I feel the same as you. There was no going back. There was definitely not a plan B. My yeah. parents weren't There's speaking no to me. There's no plan B, yeah. I'm shoplifting pizzas at this point to feed okay. myself. I'm like, I can only go forward, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I haven't paid my rent in three months. Yeah. My rent is only 150 pounds in Rush Home. Yeah. Um, but then I, and I, so I recount that moment of my life as, I, I, I zoom in on the tenacity and this certainty and this conviction. Yeah. But then I look at these diary entries and on this day, I'm like doubting myself a little bit. It didn't last. Yeah. But there was a, there was a day where it was like a rocky. For sure. You know, and that's, For you know, sure. Yeah. It's not all like, the thing is, the overarching theme is I can't go back. Yeah. It shouldn't negate the fact you're going to have doubt. You're going to question, how, you know, it's like there's the thing, somebody will believe in it, but there was like, another 10 meetings and nobody has you know you think yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and also yeah. at the end of an investor present you know, when you inv- uh, present to investors the real questioning of your integrity over your idea is how much you decide what was the last meeting they had in the room which they brought that advice to your meeting on a totally different business to kind of talk about the market or i mean the amount of times i've talked about like you know it's about growth it's not about retention it's about 70 percent new customers 30 percent retention and i was always saying no it's 60 percent retention 40 percent growth but saying this when casper mattresses was going high fly was like nobody wants to listen i know now then why they didn't invest because their whole thing was growth retention fuck it yeah, you know yeah, and yeah. it's like retention is everything you've got to damn well grow you've got to have new customers but if you don't have the bedrock of retention the kind of classic you know like companies that don't do any publicity like um, five guys or some companies yeah, yeah. that haven't done much publicity, they're relying on the customer loving it. They're relying on getting new customers from their customers. You know, they're mm-hmm. relying on the most classic word of mouth moment. But you've got to build a company on cement. And I felt at the time, these guys looking around, they're building it on quicksand. So you've got to then leave that investor meeting and think, what do I take away that's good advice. So the advice I took away to myself was, if I'm in a room of predominantly men, I want to go in and a female trait to me is you want to paint the entire picture. You want to bring somebody into your universe and you want to show them everything. So they don't have one thing they can hone in on to make sense of your business and join the dots. You don't give them the dot joiner. So therefore, the thing I learned was to go in and say, look, we're starting with this, and from this, I'm going to give you this, and then we'll get to that. And they're like, okay, and they, it's not men are slow and women are faster. It's like there is a fundamental difference in how people need information delivered to them so they can absorb it, go, yeah, that ticks my box, and then be ready to listen to the next bit of information. And that I didn't know. I didn't know into the 10th pitch. And then in the 10th pitch or whatever, halfway through my pitching, I kind of thought, actually, what am I not doing right here to convey? Because if I believe this is a good idea, if I believe it has legs, what am I not getting through to them that I need to? And that's the vision of the future kind of. It's a bit the vision of the future. It's like there's a real classic that if you are a woman, generally men, if it's predominantly males, they will ask, how do you protect your downside? And if I'm a man sitting here, they will say, how do you maximize your upside? It's a classic. All right. So when then so just to explain for people that don't understand um downside is basically like how do you how, how do you it. negate your risk yeah so so you know how do you protect your risk you know what happens if you have a problem with the product what happens if you can't find the customer what happens if blah 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 and maximizing the upside is how you're going to scale how you're going to make that business bigger so i thought to myself, okay all right so then when they would start to get to that little thing i would say you know what These three ways, like any business, is what I'll be doing. Now, let us focus on how I'm going to maximize the upside. And just kind of gently, not insultingly, sometimes I was a little bit, you know. So you became aware of their prejudice and would counteract it before they kind of had a chance to use that as a way to... to Yeah, you kind of want to bring in a conversation. Well, it took me a while, Stephen. It took me because I had never gone to, you know, when I did investor presentations in 99... I did five and I got it, you know, in those two of them invested. It was a very different time and pitching a concept. How did you counteract the prejudice that you knew was existing in those pitch boardrooms? 
Or did you? How did you it's deal with it? Because there's a part of me that thought, like I went to one and he said, I love the idea, but it will only be successful if you do it for millennials or Gen Z, because they're the only people who are going to buy like that, because women of, of your age don't know how to buy makeup online. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at the time, 26% of people bought beauty online. All right. And of that 26%, maybe 15% were in the demographic that I said. But I said, I'm providing personalization that will make a woman and I will talk to women in a way of a language they understand to think actually maybe if I went online I'd be better diagnosed than if I went in store because she has this personalization and and then when it launched and those very first few people who had never shot for makeup online did it and thought this is better than me going to Peace Jones it was like spread the word spread the word and it built on itself but at that time when the man from this uh, VC was saying that and I was like I left the room and I thought I actually would not want this person to invest in my business <laughs> anyway so there is that maturity you can get of thinking because you've got to also you know when you're going for money you very much feel the power is in their hands and there's got to be something you bring into the room where you think do I want these people mm. to invest in my business and to get to a stage where you're the one in a way on the back foot because you're wanting the cash how can you then say to yourself turn it around you know do I want these people in the business have they got something to contribute and asking them questions like what will you contribute what do you do for your other VCs I've spoken to a few you know you have this big thing saying that you get the CMOs together and whatever but do you actually do that and, and how does that happen to you and how much is this business worth in your perspective don't give out valuations oh I read on 180 million online it's, it's doing well though yeah what what can you tell me about the scale of the business to give, just to give us an inclination we've you know grown over 100 percent a year for um, over years? five years five years um, yeah we did 50 something million last year um we are we sell in 180 countries we started skincare a year and a half ago it's now 38 percent of my revenue so it's growing quite quickly. It has the highest retention. So when I look at the business and I look at retention of product, for me, the value of the business and look at what product bases there are. So that to me is an exciting place the business is going to. Um, we're localizing in different countries. So there's one thing to be sold internationally, but then when you localize, it takes a lot of... Um, personalization across different yeah it does and so we we did it when we're about 50 percent in the uk and then we're about 23 percent in australia with 10 percent in america that is a fantastic business yeah and i would like to invest what when you think about your character traits and what you bring to the business what what is that and how has that led the business to become successful because i think in founders we talked earlier about focusing on the thing you're good at yeah what is the thing that trini is good at in this business I think I'm good at understanding how women react to things and what they want and how you speak to somebody so they can hear it. I think that's probably what I know better than anyone else in the company. How do you speak to someone so that they hear it? Well, years ago I did Oprah and Oprah taught me a lot and she, was, she is an amazing woman. But when I used to do her shows, we would tell her stuff because we'd just done a book and it had become a number one times bestseller in, in America. And it was like, she helped us do that. But she would tell them stuff I'd said, and then she would repeat it three times within that half an hour. She'd just repeat it, repeat it. And I said, after it's Oprah, you, you always repeat. She said, because it registers, they get reminded, they remember. So that sense of you say something and you say it three times in maybe three different ways so that by the end of that conversation, somebody walks away with a new thought in their head. So there is that. And I don't consciously do that anymore. I think at the beginning I probably did because I remember what she said and then it, it got into a habit. But And it's also remembering who you speak to. Because when you speak, when I do my contribution to, to Trinity London of on social... 
I could be speaking to many different women. I could be speaking to a nurse on 18 grand a year who saves up every month to buy one thing. And I could be speaking to somebody who could buy 10 things and choose to buy us. Okay. So it's quite a broad remit. But they all realize, because of what I've spoken about, the importance of actually buying things that really work for your skin and not wasting your money and and not putting things on that are bad for your skin. I don't mean bad like green. I mean like don't do anything for your skin or just understanding what you should use is not what your best friend should use. And because I have I had very bad acne. I mean, like when you talked about your turning off the light, mm -hmm. okay, I used to decide what restaurant do I go into. Like if I was going out and as an 18-year-old and I had this lighting, I would literally say, can we go to another restaurant? Because you would see my acne postules um, coming down and I would go like, I'd literally, I'd be like this for dinner. Mm -hmm. So that obsession with my skin and the effect it gave on my confidence and put was a lot of what I put into when we look at what ingredients are we going to use and how are we going to use them. And we have a lab in England. You know, I'm proud of the fact we have a lab. We make things from scratch. We're not like, hey, let's put a label on here and say Trini London, you know. Are you proud of the business? Very. Are you proud of yourself? Um... Yes, I am, when I remember to be. I mean, I get... When I remember to be? No, like... You've crossed your arms. Look at the body language. No, I... <laughs> <laughs> I am. I don't... It's very easy to... Well, I never get to a place of conceit. Um, many people are proud for me, and I sometimes find that challenging. It's like I want to move the conversation on. Why? I don't know. I don't... I can't answer it, and it's just a thing. You know, but I'll have good friends of mine who've known me a long time who will just say, you know, very lovely things about having grown the business. I, I often, I'm going to have... How do you feel on this one? Because we got yeah, discuss no, no, it no. together because yeah, we must yeah. go through no, the I same do, stuff. I'm asking questions, but I, I, but you I asking, can relate. Yeah. Okay, so, so give me your feedback well, first. Well, when someone gives me a big compliment, at the same time, they're also re reminding me of everything I could lose. And so I think my, my natural way of dealing with things is to, as you've kind of described, is that forward motion. That mm -hmm. forward motion makes me feel stable. Yeah. So whenever someone comes to me and gives me a compliment about something I've achieved, it's, it's um, I always say like chaos is stability and stability is chaos. It's a moment of stability that I don't like. Like just the idea of, of, of accomplishment yeah. Yeah. creates a stability that I don't like. I want chaos. I need that forward motion to feel st stable. Mm -hmm. It's a weird one because it's like a lot of people would disagree with what you're saying in terms, yeah. <laughs> in terms of, you know, sort of a self-worth guru who's saying you've got to, you've got to, you know, take a step to, a lot of friends who say, Trin, you need to take a moment to acknowledge how far you've come. And I think what you're saying is, I'm just trying to grasp exactly your thing mm. of the chaos and stability. And I think... I can explain I, it better. Yeah. Okay. So when, when Olymp Olympians go to the Olympics, they come back, even if they've won a gold medal and they fall into a, a depression, I think they call it gold medal depression. The stats okay. around it are alarming. I, th I read one article where, it's, where it said up to 80% of Olympians post um, the Olympics feel that way. Um, I think that humans, most of us anyway, maybe that's why we're in these buildings with these amaz amazing technology, have it within us to need to, to, it goes back to what I said before we started recording about progress. Yeah. We need a sense of forward motion. We don't, the opposite of, um, what we don't want is completed goals, abundant resources, and nothing to strive for. Mm -hmm. So maybe because I'm particularly, I was particularly insecure as a child, I need, I get my worth from the sense of forward motion and accomplishment. Mm -hmm. The thought of stopping yeah. and being done is a form of psychological chaos. It's yeah. a form of purposelessness. And yeah. so I think stability is actually the forward motion, the chaos, mm -hmm. the uncompleted goals, the striving. That's mm -hmm. when I feel most stable. Okay. And when you remove that, mm -hmm. something to strive for, I feel, I feel, which people would call stability, I feel chaos. Yeah. Um, but also, I think for me and you, there is something um, where our work is, I know it for me anyway, is inherently linked at a deep, deep level to our sense of self-worth. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, it's quite, it, I feel deeply uncomfortable when I get a compliment about um, the work we do or um, when people say that to me, oh, you need to pause for a second and just think about how far you've come. Yeah. It's, it's robbing me of <laughs> something. It's, yeah, it's like, it is. Um, when will enough be enough? I don't know if enough should never ever be enough. I don't know if you should always have a little bit. I don't know. 
Because you see, you live in chaos. So I ask you that question: When will enough be enough? <laughs> when will enough be enough? There's that for Hamilton you? song: I will never be satisfied. I always think about that. Um, well, I go back to what I said: as I, I hope, I hope there's no such thing as enough in my mind. Yeah. So, so when will enough? Answer your question: When will enough be enough? It will never be because enough is always going to mean forward motion. So and progress. Enough. Yeah, it's going to be enough. enough no, because success it's... to me is forward motion okay. and progress. So success, success can't therefore possibly be any destination. It is okay. the forward the motion journey. progress. It is forward motion. It is challenge. It is autonomy. It is a meaningful goal to strive towards, and it's doing it with people I love. Yeah, that's success for me. Okay. And and so I need challenge. I need forward motion yeah. with people yeah. I love. High degree of self control. Yeah, um, it's your life breath. Yeah, and it's then my, I'll die yeah, someday yeah, as yeah. I'm doing it. Yeah, yeah, it is life breath. Yeah, it really is. As you know, Zoe are a sponsor of this podcast and I'm a big investor in the company. You guys know I'm really sitting still because that's just the nature of my life. So whether I'm in a business meeting with my investments or I'm recording this podcast, I'm always running from A to B. But the one promise that I made to myself is to fuel my body sufficiently. And Zoe has been really the key part of me succeeding in that mission. For those of you that don't know, I've been a Zoe member for about a few months now, ever since I had Zoe's scientific co-founder, Professor Tim Spector, on this podcast. Zoe helps me to understand how to make better food choices for my long-term health, and it's all personalized to me. Eating the right food is essential for me to keep me going because some of my meetings are often later in the day, and so I need to ensure that I keep my energy levels up, and Zoe allows me to understand which foods work for me and which foods don't. Eating the Zoe way, I don't get that dreaded afternoon crap and I feel great. So to get started with Zoe, go to zoe.com slash Stephen and use my exclusive code CEO10 for 10% off. So many of you have been asking me for a discount code. Here it is, CEO10. Go to zoe.com slash Stephen and use my exclusive code CEO10 for 10% off. And if you already use Zoe, send me a DM and let me know how you're getting on. What is success to you these days? Like what is, what does success mean for you? People ask me that all the time as well. But I mean, it's such a, you, when you hear that question, I think, oh, fuck. So m make it specific. Like, it's so, too generalistic. So what's, if, if I, let's look, look, look at the next decade of your life. Okay. If I say, if we meet again in 10 years time and, I say, and you say to me, that was a successful decade. All right. What oh, that's a good way. Okay. Next 10 years, successful decade. Um, the one thing, this is the only thing where I will bring age into it, right, is I am 59. So when I'm 69, do I want to be working so hard that I sort of miss friends' birthdays and don't get to, you know, take part in life of things outside my work? Because that's a big one. Like when you're in your 20s and 30s, you can kind of like all your friends are doing that too, you know, and in that same space. So it doesn't matter if you say, look, in a month we'll get together or we'll go for a weekend somewhere because you're all doing it. So it's like you're on this thing together. But when you're me, probably of my friends, maybe 80% of them, their life is slightly different from what I'm doing right now. So, and that element of that friendship and those connection with people is fundamentally crucial to our feeding our soul, you know. And there's always that, you know, guy who not the head of American Express, but he's like, you know, will I be remembered for how hard I worked, you know, on the gravestone? And there's that classic corny thing of like, will they remember how hard I, you know, it's like, they won't. But whenever I read that, I think, but they just had a nine to five job and this is a passion. You know, I always say that. I think this is so different because this is, because if I, if it was just a job, I'd probably say, you know, I should slow down a bit, whatever, but I travel the world I help a lot of people around the world. I meet a lot of people. I was in Birmingham. Um, what about work-life balance training? Yes, but this is the thing. It's like, I don't see my job as job and then there's work-life balance because there's areas of my job which would be sociable things. So I, I meet people, I have conversations with women every day, you know, on this, you know, social media thing, which is now a few, few million people. I have these women who know me really well it's so interesting how you think oh but i haven't seen you know i have my friends who have known me since i've been in my teens but i have these women who are part of the trini tribe they could be anywhere in the world but they know me so well that like i might do a little live and they'll dm me say trini i sensed this this morning are you okay do you need to take a breath you know and then when i sh i shared this 
you know, that John had died. And um, and so, you know, there were, in, you know, they sent thousands of messages. And I read, I read everything people send because if people make the effort to write a message and on my Instagram, I respond to everything. You know, I we have a team of 11 people who we have like 12,000 comments a week for Trinity London stuff. But I do all my Instagram because that's the beating heart of the women in my life and the feeling people are feeling. You know, whenever you have a business, you need to understand what is the feeling people are feeling. So in England, we have a big cost of living crisis. I still want to give people quality products that are premium. So with all these things going on, how do I sense check this thing? How do I adapt the conversation so that it still is relevant to their life and they're just so going back to this work life balance like they help me to sit for a second and like one of them sent this message three days and said Trini you have to remember to feel what you're going through right now because you don't usually you just rush through it and you need to do it it's one I've never met before ever okay <laughs> but they're just incredible women and so my when you when you talk about a business all right and you talk about starting a business business is this passion for these women to feel great and and are sort of you know you always have these what's your vision board and what's your mission as a company but it's literally to leave a woman feeling better about herself than before she came into contact with me with fearless with the podcast with Trini London with whatever so that's my mission I am here for a mission I know that sounds like whatever it's, but I am I know I am you know, I know I am. I know that when, like, I know that during COVID, when there were people feeling in a full family of people, fundamentally so alone as women, I knew how important it was that we should get out and we should chat to each other. I knew it was just to, like, really chat, really, like, share the shit, share the feeling so they could go, me too, me too, you know. So at 69 then, you're saying that you're going to slow down and retire and have pina coladas on the beach? No, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> Did I ever say that? So 69? No, so you just said to me in the next 10 years, so the next yeah. 10 years, what success look like? It's that this community grows because the more women who feel like this would tell more women, and yeah. I would like, at the moment, maybe we have a million women, mm -hmm. and I would like that to be in the next 10 years, 15 million mm -hmm. women, actually. So that I'm going to put that number out there. I'm going to now remember it. I'd like that many women because if you can get to that many women... But then how are you going to, I said that because you talked about changing the balance a little bit so you could be there for your social connections a bit more. Yeah. Your friends. Yeah. If you've got a goal of 15 million women. So how am I growing this business where I have people in place who can do things that I can do better than me? So that you can go and do... So I can do even more of what only I can do. Yeah, in the business. And in the business. In a personal context. Because at the moment, I did this thing the other day and I did this thing with my CEO and a board member and I did like 365 days a year all right and we divided up because we need to like see because pe people it's very difficult to get meetings in with so it was like okay there are six full days a year I do board meetings there are 12 days a year I do investor stuff so we added a little laugh and whatever and <laughs> it added up to more more than the days of the year okay because I haven't taken that much holiday so Jane says to me lovely Jane she goes Trini this we have to change so she said okay what do you not have to do 
you know, how could we move to a place slowly where you don't do this, you do this, and you do this so much better. It's like, you must talk to tons of people about when you have your best ideas, mm -hmm. all right? We have our best ideas when we are not further removed from the chaos, because you love this chaos, but we're, we're removed enough that things have the room to bubble to the top. Mm -hmm. So I do Michael's Car Map every morning, all mm -hmm. right? And I just started doing this other one on the, the one with the half bowl in a something, you know, that really good one. And there's this guy, David G. And it was discussed at um, Massachusetts State Hospital, they did some research that you listen to his meditation for 59 days and it changes your neural pathways like ketamine might, okay? It's really, I mean, anyway, I'm day 43, okay? Quite into it. But when I give myself that little space, the really good ideas for the business come up. And the more I'm just doing, running the business, running the business, the less we're gonna have of those. And I need to give the business the best of me. So at 69, do you think you're gonna be working less? Differently. Differently. More space for more creativity. Yeah, and, and, and you know, just, just saying, yeah, I'll take a Friday off and go and <laughs> go for a weekend somewhere and things like that. Yeah, because, you know. And would you be able to go for a weekend without thinking about the business? Yeah, I did actually. Can I just tell you, for the first time in five years, I went away for five days, two weeks ago, and I only did like eight emails, which was just great. <laughs> You wrote this wonderful book, Fearless. It's really, really surprising. It's surprising. Did you read any of it yet? Yes, I went through it. Oh, you did. And okay. I read the entire section on life. The other sections about beauty and style were a little bit more tricky. <laughs> <laughs> but I read everything in the life section about, that's where I got some of those quotes from and uh, the stuff about imposter syndrome and self-belief and all of those things. It is a, a life advice book. It is a beauty advice book. It is a style advice book. Um, and it's just a gorgeous coffee table style book. Have you seen, the thing is, this is me, okay. You want me to pass you? Yeah, because I hate looking at pictures of myself. Mm -hmm. So the whole point of doing this book was to say- You hate looking at pictures of yourself? I hate fucking looking at pictures of myself. Why? Is, I just do. So this is the book you'll have on your coffee table. Ah, that. ah okay. You see, so nice. Like just, it will ah. make you pick it up more because it's biased to have my face on the front. This is not biased. Ah, no, that is beautiful. And it's a nice little message as well. Yeah, To have exactly. a statement about yourself. Like, yeah. You know what, it's funny. When, um, when people come on the show and they have a product, I, I often try and spend some time um, talking about their products and stuff. But the thing, yeah. the thing in this case is having got to understand you yeah. and what drives you and having felt how authentic and deep your passion is, there is no need that, that all the products is just a byproduct of exactly that, what we've just experienced. So it's funny because I hear your, how deeply passionate and obsessed you are about your mission, as you call it. And I just believe the product because I know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. It's coming from a deep sense of mission that is so unbelievably authentic. That starts, sounds like in your childhood with a battle with your own skin issues and acne. Um, and the byproduct of that authentic mission is these wonderful products which are taking the world by storm. What, what, what have I got in front of me here? What okay, is... so every part, so I, I'm just giving you, I'm gonna give you the quick headlights so you can go back to your girlfriend and, and you can have knowledge. Let's just close off on this. The, the yep. book is available in September. Yes. Fab, so everyone yes. can go pre-order that now? Yeah, they can pre-order now. Yep. Great. So. Highly recommend everybody goes and pre-orders it because it's a beautiful book. Thank you very much. So, fundamental skincare, whatever, age you are or skin color you are or anything mm -hmm. is you should clean your skin properly okay you should wear spf okay every day yep. whatever your melanin levels yeah cancer being the primary cause but other aesthetics as well um you should do something that regenerates your skin and retinoids can do that mm -hmm. and exfoliants can exfoliate your skin and you should keep your skin even so vitamin c okay so those kind of me are the showstoppers in a routine. Well, what if I don't? Because I'm guilty as charged okay. all above If counts. you don't, genes might make you think, I don't need to, I'm fine. But I look at your skin and I'm going to come over now. You oh know. no, don't call me, oh fuck. So what I'm gonna do is I do this, look at me, and I close my eyes because I need to feel your skin mm -hmm. without judging you by looking at you. Okay. Right? So what I do is I just have a feel and I feel, so first thing I feel immediately is the congestion you have here, right in the center. A lot of people like women will have congestion here because they don't like to get their hair wet 
when they wash their face. You have congestion here. On sure, it's not muscle or something? Or? It's not muscle at all. I know the difference, darling. Okay. Um, and, there, and this is not like that's beard, you see, but this is congestion under the skin because you have an oily skin, so you have a sebaceous gland that can sometimes get blocked under the skin. It doesn't become a spot, but it's congested. So that's there, all right? So oh exfoliant, you're going to use... I do get a lot of spots this. there. Okay. Well, then you're going to use Find Your Balance. In fact, we've got to get you Find Your Balance. Then I go around here... Then I feel your lymph. Whenever you're feeling blocked, doing this tiny movement here mm. releases your lymph nodes and you go around the back. She's massaging my face for anyone that's listening yeah. on audio. This feels I'm not really good. your face. I'm going around your ears. Yeah, I agree to disagree. Okay. And then you go down and you want to kind of go down to your clavicle and release. This is all like a channel for all your lymph. So if you ever get a blocked face or you get dark circles, you do this kind of getting it down like this. Ah, that's like why this. women always do that thing on Instagram yeah, with the... Sure. Yeah, with the stone. So you're oilier here. Thank you. You've got a slight dark circle. Yeah, it's unslept, bit. yeah. And you've got hydrated skin, but blocked skin. So for me, the best thing you would do for your skin is you would exfoliate your skin because you need to slosh off dead skin cells and you need to clarify your skin. You need to get your pores, get the congestion out. So that means drinking water. Mm -hmm. It means having an exfoliant, a liquid exfoliant. So there Do you sell are, an exfoliant? We sell tiptoe in there. You don't have sensitive skin. So you would use one called Find Your Balance, which I'm going to give you. Okay, thank okay, you so much. Okay, and then afterwards, use a moisturizer called niacinamide. It's called Energize Me. It has something called sicinic acid in it. Sicinic acid is like, it's an ingredient that goes into your cell and goes like this. So when you put that on, your skin will wake up. You'll feel an alertness to your skin. Mm -hmm. And then you'll feel, you get off a flight and you'd feel, I don't look tired because you haven't learned. You need to touch your face. A lot of people just don't touch their face enough. You need to get the oxygen to your face. You know, you go to the gym and the oxygen goes around your body and your lymph system works and you get this feeling of aliveness. But we just leave our face alone. So you do this, you go and do it with me. Just do it with me. Get your, get your fingers like this. Yeah. Like that. So it's like you've got a scissor and do friction like this. Up, down. Up, down, then go left and right. Up, down, like that, okay? And then you want to get your hands here yeah. and you want to lift your cheekbones like this. Fast. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Feel the energy. Okay? Just let go. Now, do you feel this rushing, movement, yeah. a rush in your face? Yeah. That's your lymph. Okay. Your lymph is like your hose pipe around your face. And if you put a sort of foot on the hose pipe, it stops. You need this to move around. If it's moving around, it's releasing the toxins, taking them down here at the moment, it's leaving them on your skin, under your skin. So it's cleaning out my face? Yes, you want it to be moving. If so, there was just three things then, so tell me, tell me this. So if, if you had three things you would use. Oh, yeah, three products I would use and then sort of three principles towards skin, good skin care. Okay, you'd use Better Off, which is a cleanser in one. You go in the shower yeah. and you put this on your face. Yeah, it's, done. AHA and PHA. It's got gentle exfoliating acids. Okay. Okay. Then find your balance, which is an exfoliant, which is not there. But okay. We're going to get for you. I don't know. We'll get for you. And energize me, which you don't have. Those three things is what you're going to use. Okay. Your girlfriend will use a longer routine. I don't know what she looks like or her skin tone, but she'll probably have the retinols and she'll have the vitamin C's and a few other things. But you just need three things. So that's the products. And then the, in terms of the personal routines, you said... Drink water, sleep. Sleep. And then, like, massage my face. Yeah. Got it. Okay. I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to it. I, I, I've, I've always kind of pro procrastinated on, like, skincare routines I know, and stuff. I know, but if it's easy. If it's really yeah. easy, you'll if do it. If it's by the sink, I'll pick it up. Yeah, okay. You know, well, so. we'll just, like, we'll cement it down with blue tack. Cool. Okay. So, we have a tradition where the last guest leaves a question for the next guest, not knowing who they're going to be leaving it for. Yeah. The question left for you is... What's the one thing that gives you the most healthy pleasure in life and how can you commit to harness more of it? Going down a ski slope at 83 kilometres an hour. But the thing is, I just feel responsibility now that I can't do that anymore. Why? Because it's very dangerous, Sorry. you know. It's like I... But it is, it's a guilty pleasure because I love it. I love the speed. I love the, like, I'm just in control wind through my hair you know it's the only sport i know how to do i'm shit at every other sport sounds like the way you live life yeah probably in control high speed yeah. wind through your hair <laughs>
probably. Good man. So I can't leave one for somebody else now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the inspiration. You truly are an inspiration. Uh, tremendously, tremendously so. And I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. You should be so proud of how far you've come. <laughs> yeah. You must be so proud. Take some time to just run it, breathe it in and enjoy it, Trini, because you're going to regret it. Shut up now. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for coming and doing this. And thank you for creating a real business that's um, inspiring so many people just through its existence, but also inspiring them to be better and to feel better about themselves through the wonderful products that you've made. And I highly recommend that everyone goes and gets this book. It's more of Trini, the Trini that I'm sure you've loved in this conversation. And these products, I mean, they speak from themselves because as I said, you know exactly where they've come from. So thank you. As you may know, this podcast is sponsored by Huel. If you're living under a rock, you might have missed that. And Huel has such a wide range of products now, but there is a great way to try all of them. This is the Huel Best Seller Bundle, perfectly curated so that you can try all of the favorite products and decide which ones are your favorites. The Best Seller Bundle has a range of meals and bars, including the iconic Huel Shaker, the pot and a free t-shirt, which if you've got the free heel t-shirt, you'll understand how well that t-shirt fits. I'm not just saying that, it really, really is phenomenal. If you've heard me talking about Huel, but haven't tried it for some reason, then this is a great option for you to get to know the range and find the product that works best for you. I've tried every single Huel product in the boardroom, in the development laboratories, and in my home. And there's a couple of products which have just revolutionized my life because they meet the requirements that I'm looking for. So if you're looking to try Huel for the first time and to get into it and to join the Huligan family, I'd highly recommend you try this out.